is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Mile Higher Podcast, episode 104. And today we are talking about a super controversial and highly, highly requested case that I've wanted to talk about for a really long time. And there's been some, not new developments, but new things happening. There's been a lot of talk about this yes, online. Yes, absolutely. A lot of controversy. We'll explain why. But today we are talking about the Jalea Davis case, which is one that will just really mess with your mind. It's very confusing. I still don't know what I completely think. Yeah, it's one of those cases that has a lot of different components to it and a lot of people involved with it. Mm -hmm. But there's just not a ton of information around exactly what happened because, you know, we weren't there mm -hmm. and there wasn't a lot of witnesses that were there at the time of the incident. So it definitely feels like we're missing some information, but, but we will explain all of that. I'm sure a lot of you are really confused already. But yeah, we'll be going into uh, quite a bit of depth on this case and give you all the details surrounding it and kind of where it's at today because it's a uh, definitely an active one even though the case is actually closed there's a big following behind uh, the mother of the victim and mm -hmm. there's just a lot of activity with it so we are diving into that today but before we get into that we want to thank our sponsors for today daily harvest postmates upstart and hunt a killer thank you guys for supporting the show but we've got two uh, little news stories for you guys this week. Mm -hmm. The first story kind of came out a couple of weeks ago, but one of the most interesting things to me is kind of where the future of virtual reality is going and how it's going to be used in our lives in the future. And one of the things that they're starting to do with VR, which is actually really interesting, is that in South Korea, actually, a mother in 2016 lost her seven-year-old daughter uh, to an incurable disease. And three years later, she was actually able to reunite with her daughter, a virtual version of her in this VR world that uh, these guys created for her, which is really wild to think about. So there's this clip that I wanted to show of her actually interacting with her daughter in this VR world because it's actually it's very touching. And I think it's pretty amazing at what the technology can do now. And essentially in the clip, the mother is wearing a VR headset, you know, like you see the Oculus, I think is what it is. And then she's wearing these haptic gloves on her hands, which allow her to actually feel sensations of touch, which is really interesting. That's so interesting. I can't even really wrap my mind around how that would work. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and just show you a little bit of, the, of this clip. It's pretty amazing. This has been really controversial with people. I mean, I asked my followers just on Twitter what they thought of this. And some people said, you know, that I would be interested in that. That's right. You know, would be kind of healing. But majority of people said that could lead to even more damage, maybe. Um, and they wouldn't want to see their loved one. I saw a lot of people who had lost, you know, their parents or their own children or something that were like, I would never want to reunite with a fake version of them. Cause it's not like you're getting to actually see them. Right. It's not like you're getting a uh, access into heaven or whatever you no, believe in as no. afterlife. It's, you know, it's still a, a fake thing. Yeah. It's a fake version of them. But, um, I think if it helps people, then it's good. You know, what's wrong with having something available that helps some people, even though it doesn't help everybody. Right. And I think it's just the state of the mind of the person who is experiencing this too. Yes. If you're able to separate what's real and what's not, and you're able to go into this experience knowing that this is not your real loved one, and this mm -hmm. is just a virtual version of it. And it's there to provide some level of comfort to you. Maybe it's just for some people just being able to see their face one more time. And even in a virtual version, mm -hmm. it might be, a good thing for them. Yeah. No, I understand completely. I think, you know, it just depends on the person completely right. and like where they're at with their healing or yeah, where you are in the grief process and everything. Yeah. I was going to say, I think it's, I feel like if you're still in the grieving process, seeing this is almost going to like re trigger that experience. Cause I mean, maybe it will feel good for a few minutes, but at the end, are you really like furthering along your healing process? Right. Totally. Or are you kind of like reinserting yourself into this like traumatic s phase? It's really weird to think about. And I think it's interesting because stuff like this is only going to get more and more advanced mm -hmm. and become mm -hmm. more of a thing. And right. That, well, that's the thing with it is with this particular uh, video or um, example, the it was created over eight months it took a long mm -hmm. time they used a child actor to do all the movements for the child i was gonna say how did they do all this yeah and the voice and everything so it's all all these different pieces that they had to put together mm -hmm. to actually create this 
So did she mother. just pay for this or what was the reason? It was for a TV show actually. They oh, it did. was. Okay. Yeah. It was like televised. It has millions oh, of views. Weird. Yeah. So I don't I, know what I think about it. I wonder if eventually we'll be able to tap into people's consciousness after they've passed. Like that's an idea or too. Or capture. like even people's that are alive. If you've ever seen that episode of Black Mirror, it's called um, San Junipero. Mm -hmm. They like, you know, you can plug into a virtual reality world, but it's still your consciousness in that world. It's not like it's a fake version of everyone. Right. It's like people are active. Using technology to allow yourself to yeah. live on beyond the death right. of your physical body. That would be kind of is. interesting yeah. is like if you could capture that, but it's like, are we supposed to be able to do that? It's almost defying the laws of right. it nature. It seems very unnatural. Yeah, and it does. I'm definitely <laughs> torn on it. Yeah, there's actually another Black Mirror episode where they use actual like humanoid robots mm -hmm. to simulate a loved one so imagine taking this to the next level where they're able to create a robot essentially that looks acts talks virtually the same thing as the real person but it's a artificial mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. um, that's your loved one would you want to continue a relationship with your loved one if they you know they're able to make them into some sort of android or robotic type being would you want that i don't know i mean when i try to think about it for my own loved ones no there's no way i would want that yeah and i think i think the biggest thing with all this technology and trying to beat you know beat death or cheat death is that mm -hmm. when you look at the natural processes of the universe it's it's very natural for there to be death yeah and death and then creates more life so if you're constantly trying to prevent death or continue let you know your own life even is that really the way that it's supposed to be and right could that lead us down a very very dangerous road where we could essentially lose all sense of self because mm -hmm. self is could be anything it, it's not even about having a physical biological body it could be you know i could be a version of myself and all these different types of beings and robot robots and things like that so mm -hmm. it could get really wild and crazy and confusing and what kind of world would that be? Yeah, I completely agree. I feel like it's just against everything that makes us human. And I don't know. I'm, it makes me really uncomfortable. This, you know, the VR stuff is one thing. But yeah, trying to alter how long you can live and all that kind of makes me a little uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But well, I'm like, sure we'll see it in our lifetime. Technology is moving at such a rapid rate. It's honestly just overwhelming. Especially VR. I think the VR experience is going to end up being virtually yeah. indistinguishable from natural reality which will yeah. be a really really crazy day where you can enter a virtual world and essentially exist in the same way sense of smell touch mm -hmm. is all there mm -hmm. and you could easily get lost in that world and completely forget about the physical one which yeah, is and really I've, bizarre I've said that so many times but it's so scary to think about people that will definitely just plug in and never unplug they will just sit there or they'll like get off to go to the bathroom and eat and then they'll be right back there living in their alternate life Especially if you can alter it to be the exact way that you want. Yeah, right? And right. They're who, like, who I hate my real life. Bit. Why wouldn't I live in this fake world? I right. know there will be people that do that. And that'll be really interesting. I wonder if there'll be like a name for someone like that. You know? Yeah, there probably will be. That just I'm like sure. doesn't, they're not participating in this life <laughs> they're, anymore. They're literally they're just, checked out. Yeah. They're checked out. <laughs> they're checked out and docked in. That's just crazy to think about. I yeah. wonder if people will be able to like commit crimes while they're in that world and then how will that be regulated or just like laws in general yeah. how do you do we are we gonna have to start like creating like societal norms and laws yeah. in this other world and are we going to make exceptions to things that we wouldn't allow in this real world because it's a fake world and like where's that line drawn it's so like it's like endless possibilities mm -hmm. of what's going to happen when this becomes a normal everyday thing that people are using. Yeah, it's going to really be creepy. really interesting to watch it all roll out and how people react to it when it's more, you know, just everywhere. Yeah, I mean, if you look at where video games are right now and in some of these video games, you can do literally anything you want. So. Yeah, and it's like you're not actually harming anyone in these video game worlds. It's like money's endless. You can just get more money. But once uh, you I think can't kill someone, because right. they'll just come back. Right. Like, will you be able to kill someone in VR? Do they actually die? Like, can you hold someone accountable for a crime? I don't know. It it's, just depends on how so connected. Yeah, I guess it just depends on how connected your physical self is to the VR experience. And it's like, is everyone going to be in the same VR world or is it going to be their own, you know, individual experience at their 
VR station or yeah. VR station. <laughs> you know what I mean? Though? Like, yeah. will everyone have their own world? Like when you turn on a video game, unless you're live, you're like just in your own world. It's right? all, you know, AI that's running around with mm -hmm. you unless you play in an online version of it where there's other humans running around. So it's, it's a very interesting uh, scenario that we'll have to just see how it plays out because mm -hmm. the future is going to be crazy. I feel it like. is. <laughs> I know. I can't wait to see what our intro topics are going to be in even like five years. Oh, I know. <laughs> we'll probably revisit all of these and, and we'll have yeah. some crazy thing that just was released that mm -hmm. everybody's into. But the next story I wanted to talk about is an ongoing one. Obviously, we all know about the coronavirus or COVID-19. And this, you know, in the past week or two, it's kind of gotten a lot worse. And, and just, you know, the governments have been coming out and talking about mm -hmm. how this could be a, a really big deal and prepare you know, get your emergency preparedness to get, you know, kits together and everything and prepare to be, you know, locked down for a while, even here in the U S because we're starting to see cases of people getting infected with the coronavirus who have not traveled to China or places where it exists. And it's, you know, they're in their home even. So it's very weird that we still don't know how it's actually being transmitted. This well, they must be getting in contact with someone who has it. No, there, as far as we know, some of these cases have not had any interaction with other people, which is really weird. But how would we know? Well, we don't know. That's that's the big problem is we don't know. That's true. So, but the fact that people are in it, and I believe these people are in states where it already is there. Right. Um, but still, that's scary to think about. We don't know how it's being transmitted. We do know that it's person to person now. It's not just like mm -hmm. animal to, to human. So it's spreading a lot quicker with over 85,000 people confirmed infected and almost 3,000 people confirmed dead. Wow, that jumped up fast. But one of the things that I think is the media has kind of blown it up and made it a lot mm -hmm. bigger deal than it may or may not be mm -hmm. and really aren't focusing on the fact that people are recovering from it. Yeah, I feel like you never elderly that are. Yeah, when you, you know, look at the people that sick, are dying weak. are underlying conditions mm -hmm. or they're just of older age and it's harder to fight. Yeah. a really serious pneumonia or bronchitis or something. It's definitely not, you know, a death sentence to get coronavirus. Most people can fight it. Right. It's been a mis huge misconception among people. Right. It's that everyone who gets it will die. Yeah. And it just depends on your immune system too and how mm -hmm. well you fight infection and things like that. Because mm -hmm. there still is no vaccine. There's still no treatment for it. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to, I guess you have to ride it out and just hope your body is able to, you know, obviously they can give you some stuff, but I think a lot of it is just time and, and kind of fighting through it and, and doing everything you can to Sounds awful. get healthy again. So one of the things I wanted to focus on, though, with the coronavirus is the origin of it, because this has been something that has been highly questioned by people. And mm -hmm. some people out there have started to present some theories around where it might have originated from, that it may not have actually come from, you know, the Wuhan market or from an animal at all. And, you know, scientists are still very divided on this, but uh, some studies have suggested that there were a significant number of early patients who had no contact with the actual market itself and that it could have been spreading silently among people uh, before it actually ever even went into the market itself. That's that's kind of crazy to think about. And one of the things that's kind of suspicious to people is the fact that the Chinese government has done a really good job at preventing news of the outbreak from reaching the public. Mm -hmm. And they went even as far as to silence some of the medical workers who tried to warn the world about the virus after treating the, the first patients. Yeah, that's really interesting. There have been a bunch of different videos that have come out and some people have questioned the authenticity of some of them, but mm -hmm. I think some of them are real and people have gone missing yeah. after reporting you know, the truth about what's going on with this. And it seems like now it's overflowing and they can't contain Well, the now truth it's gone anymore. global too yeah. and you know, it's a lot harder to, it's reached mm -hmm. the entire internet so it's a lot harder to keep people quiet about it but it's yeah it's created a lot of doubt about the official story of how it started yeah it's very sketchy there's a lot of doubt there's a lot of conspiracy around yes i yes. mean there's a lot of theories and i don't i don't really know enough to make a full opinion on a lot of those but yeah so um, I'll, I'll give you a couple of these theories here so there was a paper that was published and then later deleted by two chinese scientists that said that the virus probably quote unquote, originated from one of two labs in Wuhan. So 
scientists in China that yeah. published this official paper and it was deleted and obviously they discounted it or whatever. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting about this is that the two labs that they discussed in this report are the Wuhan Center for Disease Control, which is literally located less than 300 meters away from the market which is oh, where the center of the outbreak is. So not that far away from this wow. market where they have, you know, the disease control center. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which is 20 miles away from this area, which is actually has a lab that has a level four, like biohazard level where they are literally working on this virus in it. Oh my gosh. They're working on infectious diseases. They have all of these viruses in there. So one of the theories is that it got leaked out somehow of one of these labs and started infecting people. And, and instead of, you know, confronting it head on, they kind of were trying to keep it quiet and try to like, you know, make it all go away. But it was too late and the virus infected this market and, and the surrounding areas. And it's just kind of been spreading from then, uh, then on. So interesting. I've actually watched videos of scientists debunking this, though, and saying there's no way they could have man made this and we're giving humans way too much credit and they're not capable of that. But I don't know. Could be part of the narrative. But but we do know that know. they are working with the mutated coronaviruses in on bats in this lab. That's, That's a really confirmed thing. We just don't have any way to confirm whether or not it was actually leaked. So like I said, many people believe that the coronavirus was leaked from this Wuhan Institute of Virology who is supposedly researching biowarfare. And actually U.S. Senator Tom Cotton was one of the people who mentioned that the markets were only a few miles from the lab. And he said, we don't have evidence that this disease originated there, but because of China's duplicity and dishonesty from the beginning, we need to at least ask the question to see what the evidence says. But obviously, like Kendall said, a lot of international scientists have continued to sort of debunk these theories and, and say that the coronavirus most likely originated in wildlife. But the last little theory that's kind of gone out is actually in 2019 in the Netflix series explained Bill Gates, billionaire Bill Gates, predicted a killer virus could originate in China's wet markets to rapidly infect the world. And he said this not that long ago, oh, yeah. which, you know, a lot of people are like, well, this could be some sort of plan by the global mm -hmm. elite or, you and know, he knew about it and he knew about that this was going to happen. And this was intentionally unleashed on to the public to deal mm. with overpopulation and all that it gets very more wild evidence right right and there's not a, a ton of evidence around that at all that so. is interesting he was so specific in his statement before yeah well it's either that it goes the dark way or the other way is that this virus is being used to uh get a lot of profit from the vaccine because oh. bill gates is actually has a company who's attempting to develop a coronavirus vaccine. Oh, that's an interesting theory then. So mm -hmm. a lot of people think that maybe there's some connection there and just it's knew like, about it before. It's just hard to believe. I definitely need more evidence. <laughs> it is hard to believe because we, we're we taking people's word at this point. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of concrete proof that this happened. So yeah, I just thought it was interesting to share some of the theories surrounding the coronavirus and kind of where it's at right now. But before we get into the case we're covering today, we would like to thank our first sponsors for today. If you have not tried Postmates, you are missing out, my friend. It has made life so much more convenient. Other than your absolute best friends, who can bring you red wine at 4 p.m., sushi at 9 p.m., and a breakfast burrito at 8 p.m.? Postmates can. You do you, they don't judge, they just deliver. Postmates can be your personal food delivery, grocery delivery, whatever you can think of delivery all year round. We have used it especially for our pets for last minute needs like pet food. If you want a hot tub filled with champagne, they can bring you that. They can bring you enough champagne to fill a hot tub. So download the app for iOS and Android free. Browse the local restaurants and businesses and track your delivery. It's open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Postmates will bring you whatever you want within an hour. And for a limited time, Postmates is giving our listeners a $100 credit in free delivery for you to use in your first seven days. To start deliveries, download the app right now and use the code mile higher that's code mile higher for $100 of free delivery credit your first seven days when you download the postmates app get everything you need anytime you need it just download the postmates app and save with the code mile higher today as most of us have found out the hard way getting into debt is easy but getting out is hard especially if your credit score isn't great thankfully now there's upstart.com the revolutionary lending platform that knows you're more than just your credit score and offers smarter interest rates to help pay off high interest credit card debt. This could have came in handy for me a couple years ago when I racked up some credit card debt and didn't really have an efficient way to pay that credit card debt down. Not only that, my credit score
score wasn't great, so it was very hard for me to get a loan to consolidate that debt. But that's what's cool about Upstart is they go beyond the traditional credit score when assessing your credit worthiness. They actually reward you based on your education and job history, and they give you a smarter interest rate because of that. What's also awesome is they make it fast, simple, and easy to check your rate. Since it's just a soft pull, it won't affect your credit score. The hard pull happens if you accept your rate after they run it. The best part is that once the loan is approved and accepted, most people get their funds the very next business day. Over 400,000 people have used Upstart to pay off credit cards or meet their financial goals. Free yourself from the burden of high interest credit card debt by consolidating everything into one monthly payment with Upstart. See why Upstart is top ranked in their category with a 4.9 out of 5 rating on Trustpilot and hurry to upstart.com slash milehired to find out how low your Upstart rate is. Checking your rate only takes a few minutes. That's upstart.com slash milehired. Okay, so before we get into the Jalea Davis case, I just wanted to talk about something from last week. As you guys know, if you listen to the episode, we had Jenny Carrieri come on the show. And a couple of days after the episode went up, I did get a text message from her that said some of the comments that she read hurt her feelings. And that was really upsetting because we don't ever want people to come on our show and feel hurt obviously. Yeah. I mean, they should not be leaving the show feeling like their, you know, their feelings are hurt and yes. people are being mean to them. It's just not cool. So I just kind of wanted to address this and say that, you know, we appreciate comments from you guys, no matter what they are, whether that's positive feedback or negative feedback, constructive, we love it. It's fine. You guys can say whatever you want, but when it comes to victims, family members being on our show here to tell the story of most tragic thing that has ever happened in their life. We appreciate it if you guys would leave only kind comments for them on those episodes because, you know, I don't think people realize that the victim is going to go read these comments. They're obviously going to want to see the feedback. And a lot of people were nitpicking her for little things. And some people even said things like, what's the point of this? This is never going to get solved. You know, what's the point of even having her on the show? And You know, those types of things just aren't okay. And I was just disappointed. I thought our community was better than that. And for the most part, you guys, the comments were amazing. They normally are. But I did see a lot this week that were just really complaining. And a lot of people did bring up the fact that they felt it was confusing, which I think is fair. Listening back to it, we felt it was confusing too. And we definitely have learned from the interview that we want to change our style a little bit. And in the beginning, we do have a victim's family member on the show that we want to, you know, do an overview, a summary yeah. before we actually have them on for the interview, because it's just a little chaotic with them. We want to be sensitive to them, but also tell the story. And, you know, yeah, it was definitely a learning experience for us. So we mm-hmm. definitely learned some things and hopefully you guys learned some things from this and and just realize that they don't have to do this. They don't have to come on a, a platform like this with thousands of people that are mm-hmm. are watching and listening and say anything and the fact that she was brave enough to do that and Mm -hmm. share all these intimate details about her life and her sister and what happened to her is a really amazing thing and and kudos Mm -hmm. to jenny for doing that because it it takes a lot of strength and courage to do that and and i can only imagine to see people nitpicking about how she says stuff or you know just whatever it is it's just it doesn't need to be there you know we don't just yeah. keep it to yourself. Like if yeah. there's something that you feel towards somebody that is a victim that we have on our show or, or any guest for that matter, it's just yeah. like, keep it to yourself, you know, keep it to yourself. You don't need to to spread that around. Mm-hmm. 100%. I feel like people expected her to be like an entertainer or a public speaker. She's not, she's just an average person whose twin was murdered. Right. And when people go through trauma, it, it is difficult to talk about that trauma. So obviously you know, she was nervous. She was stressed out. And so in the future, we just hope that comments regarding family members stay positive only. That is our request. But anyway, let's get into this case. Oh my gosh. This case is also really graphic. It's really upsetting. I feel like we need to tell you guys that in advance. Uh, We have to talk about the condition of Jalea's body and it is not a pretty picture to say the least. It's brutal. that being said, their family does want awareness spread about this case. They want as many people to hear about it. And we just want to present all the info for you guys and you can make your own mind up about what you think happened. I just want to remind people that it's okay to not fully know what you think, though. You know, I feel so many people in true crime cases feel you need to make up your mind or come up with a stance. And I'm not going to force myself to come up with an opinion completely because this is so sensitive and there's just so many pieces missing that I feel like I can't fully do that. And that's okay to do. 
Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. I mean, I feel like that's the best way to be. I mean, none of us here are investigators or, mm-hmm. or detectives. We haven't worked on this case for years. And, you know, we don't have the knowledge that the people or the authorities or the actual family involved with it has. So mm-hmm. I think it's good to just remain open minded about about it and just and look at the evidence. That's what we always try to push yeah. on our show is being open minded. Exactly. So the Jalea Davis case is involving Jalea Davis, who was born in November 2nd, 1991, and, and she's 20 years old at the time of her death. And we're also going to be talking about her mother, Kim Davis, and her sister, Tobby Davis, who was a few years younger than Jalea. I've been seeing so many requests for this case specifically, and I know that it's because of the recent controversy around this case. So I just want to address it before we start as well. There is a podcast about this case completely dedicated called Mile Marker 181, Mm -hmm. and it's hosted by Emily Nestor. And she worked with the family to create a podcast and a movement around justice for Jalea. And the whole podcast was on the family side. It was on the side of Jalea being murdered. And then recently she actually changed her mind and started putting out episodes with a completely different narrative. She has changed her mind to think that this was an accident. And she's been recently putting out episodes proving how it was an accident. Right. So there's been a lot of fighting between her and her mother, Kim Davis. Mm -hmm. Um, There's been a lot of fighting online over this. There have been people who are very upset that she changed her whole stance on the whole thing right and then the other reason people are really upset here is because she's also creating a documentary that was supposed to be or they thought it was going to be about julia's case but it actually turns out that it's about the podcast host and her experience covering this case right so that's you know what's going on i wanted to just give you guys kind of an update so you feel like you know what's going on right now going into this but yeah there's been a lot of you know, mixed opinions all over the place. People really upset, people agreeing with Emily, people agreeing with the family. It's just kind of a really awkward situation. Yeah, it's gotten really crazy, to be honest. Like Mm -hmm. if you go look up the Mile Marker 181 podcast, you'll see immediately when you start looking at reviews and comments on it about what's going on, if you're interested in knowing the the drama around it in more detail. But yeah, it's, it's really, really controversial. And people are really upset. You'll see why once we go through this case. But her argument is interesting. So we definitely want to, you know, look at her new stance yeah. on everything and kind of just let you guys decide what you think. Right. Absolutely. We'll look at both sides. But the family, the Davis family lives in Marietta, Ohio, which geographically, if you look at this on a map, it's kind of confusing because it's literally on the border of West Virginia. And the Ohio River separates the two states, but you can easily go back and forth between the two states. So that's essentially what happens in in this case is that they are going across into uh, West Virginia and back to Marietta, Ohio. So that's where the actual case takes place physically is in these towns. So on Saturday, November 19th, 2011, Jalea went out with her friends, Kristen Bechtold, Jordan Campbell, Freddie Scott, and Katie Nelson. These are the main people involved with this case. And these were apparently newer friends. I know at least Kristen, she'd only been friends with for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely newer friends. And as far as backgrounds of the friends, we don't know a whole lot, but we do. There is some things swirling around that some of these people were, you know, in more shady crowd, potentially one of them was even a drug dealer. So there's there's that to consider as well. But Jalea began drinking at a friend's home at approximately 10 p.m. where Kristen reports that she had at least 28 shots of Schrock vodka. And after finishing the bottle, they went out to get another and continued to drink. 28 shots of vodka. That is That's shocking. Insane. Yeah. I had 11 shots on my 21st birthday and I was annihilated, dude. Remember, I was like on the ground at the <laughs> end of the night. That was awesome. Well, I was rolling on the floor. <laughs> I've never um, taken that many remotely close to that many shots. Yeah, I've never done it again. It's a ton. But 28, that's, uh, how would you even be functioning? I don't know. I mean, unless you're somebody that drinks a lot on a regular basis, I guess you you kind of build some resistance to it. But still, 28 shots. And that's just pre-gaming. They're just mm-hmm. pre-gaming at, at, at a house. Yeah, but we don't know that house. she actually did that. Right. Well, that's the thing, though, is we have to take Kristen's word for it. We don't know mm-hmm. for sure. if she. Had we know to. she was drinking for sure. Mm-hmm. But we don't know how much. So then at approximately 12 a.m. to 1 a.m., Julia, Kristen, Freddie, Jordan and Katie go to a club called the Nip and Q, which what kind of 
name is it? Nip and Nip Q. And Q? I thought it was a barbecue place when I first saw that. I was like, what is this place? Nip and Q makes me think of like pool cues and nipples. Like, yeah. what is this? Like a pool bar where there's topless girls? Yeah, I don't know. That's such a weird name for a club, I feel like. That the really Nip is. And Q. But they go to the Nip and Q and they have more drinks. And Kristen mentions that Julia was dancing suggestively with an ex-boyfriend of Katie's. And obviously they took issue to that and it kind of created some fighting amongst them. So she's clearly probably, you know, grinding or dan they're at the club you know they're mm -hmm. they're pop lock and dropping it so this is from the official interview with katie nelson katie reports that herself kristen beck told freddie scott and jalea left the nip and cue all together and they drove to where jalea's car was left parked and dropped jalea off at her car so that seems like a pretty typical situation you know knowing that she had drank that much why are they dropping her off at her car yeah exactly this whole thing seems really weird to me because if you mm -hmm. had 28 shots how are you even going to be able to get into a bar i'm yeah. like i don't think anyone yeah. could be like coherent enough to uh, for the bouncer to be like you yeah, know it looks good to me come on yeah. in most people are gonna be like ah uh, you are belligerent no mm -hmm. i mean unless she was like incredibly good at there's no way handling her alcohol that is no blows my mind that she's even coherent enough to get to a bar I wonder if she said something like, oh, she had like 28 shots, you know, just casually. Like, did she sit there and count no, each shot? No. Like, all right, what number you want? Keep they going, sweetie. Drinking. It's like 21. That makes no sense to me. Can I you, feel like there's no way she had that many shots. Like, absolutely not. No. And when, and when buy that. you look at her blood alcohol content, which we'll talk about here in a bit. It's it, high. It's high, but, but I don't know high? if it's high enough to do a couple bottles of vodka like that's Man, crazy know. but according to their statements about that night after dropping Julia off at her car she reports that Kristen Freddie and herself left and went to McDonald's at the traffic circle and after ordering from McDonald's Katie reports that Freddie then drove her and Kristen back to Kristen's house in Greenmont Hills so this is what Katie's saying about what had happened right and they're just saying that we left Julia off at her car and then we went you know, and did her own thing. And that was the end of the night. Mm -hmm. At around 3.30 a.m. on the 20th, Julia called her sister Tabby and asked to be picked up at an intersection. But then she called back at 3.38 a.m. to change the pickup spot to a rest stop off I-77 just across the border in Williamstown, West Virginia. And during these calls, according to Tabby, she heard Julia sobbing and cursing at Kristen Bechtold. And when Tabby asked Julia what was wrong, she states that Julia said, I will tell you when you get here. Now, we don't know for sure. It's not like we have a record of this call. So we don't know that she was yelling at Kristen. We don't even know if she was for sure yelling. But, you know, that's what Tabby said. And I wonder if she said Kristen on the phone or something that would have made her think it was like, what if she was yelling at Katie? How does she know it was Kristen? Well, I think according to Tabby, she believes she heard Kristen's voice. It's like, like, how well does she know her, though? Julia had only known her for a couple months. I think they probably met at some point. Like she knew who they were. Like mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure they had met each other. So, so she, she was familiar she was with Kristen and what she sounded like. And according to Tavi, she believed she heard Kristen in the background of the phone call. But then again, we don't have any way to know this for sure. And one of my thoughts is maybe she was upset at Kristen for having her keys. Because one of the things that uh, her sister said she heard on the phone call was her say, give me my key back. Um, so maybe Kristen was holding her keys, not wanting her to drive and they were in a fight over it and she was crying or maybe that's why she was yelling at her. Mm -hmm. I have yelled at my friends. Like I have yelled at Janelle when I'm drunk. I have been mean. I get mean when you're really drunk like that. You can be like way more obviously emotional and upset and angry. We don't know if something really bad happened and that was causing her to yell at her or if it was something simple, like she didn't, she wanted to drive and right. couldn't or Maybe something else had happened. Maybe it's regarding Katie and the whole boyfriend drama. Right. I mean, who really knows? Mm -hmm. That's the thing is so much information is missing here. You can yeah. come up with so many different theories of totally. what it could have been about. Well, I wanted to mention that the timeline itself is probably the most confusing thing. When we start talking about times and exactly at what time things happen, there seems to be a lot of confusion about that as well as exactly what time was Jalea dropped off at her car. So now I want to read a bit of Kristen Bechtold's statement to police about what happened at the end of that night, because it's it's very interesting and, and it kind of sends things maybe a different way. So Kristen said that we were sitting in the car trying to figure out what we were going to do, if we were going to go inside or if we were going to go home. Jalea was talking to blank. The name is actually crossed out, so we don't know who she was talking to on the phone. 
And I think she was trying to go hang out with him. So this is a boy that she was mm. on the phone with prior to calling Toby. And I think she was trying to hang out with him or whoever he was with and she couldn't find her wristlet. Her wristlet was somewhere in the car and she was getting like, she was like fussing with me about it because she thought I did something with it. And I told her that I had tried to take it away from you like a few times tonight so that you wouldn't lose it. And she basically was just like, I don't know where it is. She was kind of like blaming me for it. And I was like, I don't have it. So I found it for her and we found her keys because she needed to get something out of her car. And uh, we decided that we were going to go home. And we thought that Julia was going to come with us, but she ended up calling her sister and asked her to come pick her up and said she needed a ride. So I don't know if she was trying to go hang out with that guy or if she was trying to go back to her house. Based upon this statement, it seems like Kristen could have been with Julia when she called Tabby. Mm -hmm. So that would make sense because she's fighting, like you said, she's fighting with her about the keychain, her keys, right. the wristlet is what she's calling it. But the keychain essentially that had her keys on it. Mm -hmm. So they're fighting back and forth about it. She's trying to figure out if she's going to hang out with this guy or if she's going to actually go home or get a ride uh, to go home. Now the keychain is important too, because she had some special keychain that was like really expensive and meant a lot to her and her family were like, she loved it. She would never have taken it off and her keys were found without it. It's missing. Mm -hmm. Maybe at one point Kristen threw the keys at her in anger and it broke, broke off. I don't know. It's really interesting to think about. Or just like pulling it in between them. Like yeah, it could have been maybe fighting over. Like, she grabbed it, pulled it off. Totally. That's totally a possibility. So here's another portion from the police statement that's interesting. So the officer says, did you hear her say where she was going to have get her at? Assuming it's Tobby get her at. And Kristen said, I don't think so. She went to get out of the car and she said, Tobby, I need you to come pick me up and I will explain what is going on when you get here. And she didn't tell her where to pick her up. She, we got out of Freddie's car and she went to get in her car. And we were asking her, we were saying, is your sister for sure going to come pick you up? You are not going to drive anywhere. Are you sure you're not going to drive? If she had any intentions of driving, then I wasn't aware. So based upon this, Julia has dropped off her car to wait for her sister to come pick her up is what they're saying and kind of the way that this would make sense, right? Mm -hmm. If you know, not you're not going to drive home because clearly you've had a lot to drink and you're going to call your sister to have him come pick you up. Right. So the male that was with him that night is Freddie Scott. And he told the police that he was kind of drunk and saw Julia get into her car and that she wasn't falling over drunk, which is kind of hard to believe. And he's After quote, 28 shots. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And plus, even if she wasn't falling over drunk, what kind of shit friend let someone drive? Even get in their car. They alone. were all driving. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing is they were all driving while intoxicated. Pretty much all of them. And according to Freddie, he said that Kristen stated that she tried to ensure that Julie would not be driving due to how intoxicated she was. So that that's the whole thing is we don't know exactly what happened there, whether or not she actually got in the car and turned it on or what what exactly happened there at what point they left Julia. Mm -hmm. Because that whole yeah, section is foggy, very foggy. We really don't know. Based upon these statements, they're not really even giving a lot of exact details because, I mean, they're intoxicated, so they probably right. don't remember exactly at what point they left or what time it was. So that's why this is so cloudy. But then shortly after this, 911 calls start coming in at 341 a.m., 348 a.m., and 352 a.m., and, and I'll go ahead and just, uh, unfortunately they haven't released the 911 call audio, so we can't play the actual audio, but I'm going to just read the initial 911 call report so you can kind of get a picture of what's happening at this point in time. So this conversation is recorded on November 19th, 2011 at 3:41 AM and 911 is saying, what is your emergency? The reporting person said, yeah, I'm calling about a car that's broke down on 77 North. Okay. Where at on I 77 on the 181 or so. The lights are on. It's up against the guardrails. Something's going on there, but I couldn't see anybody. It's pretty cold out, so I don't know what's going on over there. 911 says, can you give me a vehicle description like red car or a blue truck? And they say, all I know, it's a car. He had his lights on. He's right by the car. He's up against the guardrail. So there's something going on over there, but I couldn't see anybody standing around. So, you know, the car or the people I couldn't see, but the lights are on in the car or something's going on over there. And that was the extent of, of that 911 call. So the next 911 call comes in seven minutes later at 3.48 a.m. And the reporting party uh, is recorded as saying, stay in the vehicle, I'm going to keep the doors locked, just stay here. 911 says, what is your emergency? Sir, I'm at the 
4.6 mile marker northbound on I-77. I cannot make a confirmation of this right now. I'm walking back. I think I just seen a human being lying dead on the highway, sir. 911 says, okay, and you walked away from your vehicle. The person said, I'm getting out of my vehicle and I'm walking back where I seen the person. And you think you're at 181? The 181 mile marker, sir, I haven't confirmed it yet. And then 911 asked, like, what's your name? And the person said their name and they said, we drove by and you know how it's dark and you can't see, but I'm just about pretty sure it might have been a person. Gosh, I really don't want to, to walk back here. You know what I'm saying? And then 911 says, I understand what you're saying. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, sir, you don't have to. Stay where you're at and I'll have somebody come up there. And then the person said, I'm getting closer to it. I'm hoping it's a deer, sir. I'm really am, but I'm pretty sure I saw what I saw. Oh man, in fact, there's some other people. I don't know if you're getting more phone calls. Two other guys just stopped down here at the bottom of the hill. Oh man. 911 says, okay, sir, do you know your cell phone number? Is it blank? I'm getting closer to it. Oh man, I'm hoping it's a deer. I'm hoping I can't. I got my boy. 911 says, in any way, when hit did you pull along the side of the guardrail, sir? Yes, sir. I'm pulled along the side of the guardrail. There is a chemical tanker truck that just pulled over. It's getting closer to it now. I'm getting closer to it now. There is a semi-tanker truck that's coming at me right now. No, stay over here, truck driver. Stay over here. Stay over here. Oh my gosh, I can't get over here in traffic. Yes, sir. Confirmation, human body. Oh my gosh. God. 911 says, do you want to check to see if this person is still alive or breathing? Sir, there is parts of him. I can't. Oh my God. Oh my God. Sir, turn around and don't look at him. Okay. Turn around and don't look at him. Oh my God, sir. Sir, you need to hurry up and get people here, please. Okay. We got people on the way to you, sir. Can I start stopping traffic? This might be a crime scene. Yeah. So essentially the transcripts go on to talk about the fact that there is a tanker driver. So a, a tanker is like one of those big semi trucks, I believe that carries gasoline to mm. gas stations, big old truck, big heavy truck. And this truck seemingly has been involved in this scene that's going on now with this human body that's laying in the road. Now her body was in absolutely horrific condition. She was found naked from the waist up decapitated her right breast was actually missing and one of her legs were broken in half. So the you know, extent of damage on her body was just insane, so much so that this guy thought it was a man. He couldn't even tell that it was a body or who it was. I mean, oh, it was, it's just, I think that's one of the most upsetting things about this case is just the, the damage on her body. And then her car was found two tenths of a mile up the road, still running with the headlights on. Yeah. So that's kind of the scene. So another important note is that Tabby, because she had gotten off the phone with her sister, actually went to the meeting place where Julia said to come pick her up. And obviously she wasn't there. So they started looking around and obviously they started noticing that on the highway nearby, they noticed there was a bunch of, of commotion happening over there and they actually went over there. And I believe Tabby and a friend actually came upon the scene before police actually even arrived there. Obviously, the other motorists that had been reporting it had stopped and, and mm -hmm. their actual highway had, had been stopped at that point as far as traffic going by. But Tabby, I believe, arrived on scene before even police arrived and oh. saw her sister in that condition. That's terrible. Now, strangely, Jalea's clothing was actually found in kind of an organized pile, in an organized fashion, you could say. It was piled up in order. So it was, I think, bra first, then T-shirt, and then a white petticoat on top of that right so police didn't actually arrive on the scene until 4 a.m and deputy deem with the wood county sheriff's office was the responding officer and the road had already been closed like based on the 911 calls mm -hmm. they they shut the highway down because there's body parts all over the road it's a complete scene there so yeah. he begins interviewing the people that are there and he speaks to tobby and tobby explains the calls that she had received from julia so right away police are thinking that this is a drunk driving accident especially because her sister said that she was on the phone she needed a ride that she was drinking and she was upset and as far as we know and based upon reports of the people that first ar arrived on the scene julia was the only person around the car there was no other person in the car still or any in the surround or evidence of the surrounding areas of there being somebody else with her right. as far as we know and the police did note that the clothing was you know stacked in that specific way 
but they claim that it was ripped off of her during her car accident and just ended up that way. I guess so. That's really hard to believe. And it's also based upon talking to the truck driver that was there. Cause like we said earlier, the truck driver actually pulled over because he reported actually hitting something. Yeah. And as far as we know, he actually ran over Julia after being injected from the vehicle. So you can imagine the damage on her body. And obviously that makes this whole scene so much more difficult to process Right. when there's something, a truck drove through the crime scene or the scene, whatever you want to call it after, you know, the event happened Mm -hmm. that just makes it so much more confusing and hard to figure out what happened here. Yeah. Because one of the things that can be helpful with determining the cause of death or even trying to figure out if someone was murdered is the autopsy and being able to look at a body that's somewhat still intact. And Mm -hmm. and, and in this case, it it wasn't at all. And you don't know where the injuries are from. Exactly. There's no way to really discern what exactly happened after just getting completely run over by a, a truck. So it made it a lot more difficult for the authorities to really figure out what happened, but based upon the initial assessment of the scene and, and what they learned, it seemed to them that this was a horrific drunk driving accident and that she was ejected from the vehicle and then into the road where she was then run over. And we'll explain that theory a little more in depth later on, but that's roughly what they were thinking. What, you know, had yeah, happened, right? But the next morning at 7.35 a.m., Detective White and Deputy Deem went to Vienna, West Virginia to Kristen Bechtold's home. So at the house, the police notate that there's two vehicles in the driveway, one Cadillac and one Dodge. And they also noted that the Cadillac had a lot less frost on it than the Dodge, indicating that it may have been driven much more recently because it was on and and hot. So that would make sense. Mm -hmm. So maybe that vehicle was out the night before, I guess, is what they're they're trying to Uh, say but according to kim davis julia's mom the pictures that they supposedly took of this don't exist Mm -hmm. and we've never seen them but essentially the officers knock on the door and ring the doorbell and no one answers and so they leave their business card at the residence for a call back and they're only there for like 15 minutes so probably about 20 minutes after police visit kristen's house katie nelson who was with them the night before actually voluntarily went into the sheriff's office and obviously her parents were urging her to go in and talk to them about Mm -hmm. what had happened because this is extremely tragic and i'm sure they heard pretty soon after it Mm -hmm. happened that julia had died and she says that she dropped julia off at her car where her sister was supposed to pick her up and that was that's the extent of what we know she said i i assume that her parents were like you need to go clear your name and make sure that Mm -hmm. You know, they don't think you're involved in some way and which is the right thing to do to go in and talk to police and give as much information about what, you know, happened the night before. Right. And Kristen took the completely opposite approach. I think both of their parents had similar reactions, but their approaches were completely different, which definitely raises some suspicion with Kristen for sure. Because at 6.47 p.m., the police actually go back to Kristen Bechtold's home and her father states that she didn't feel like talking and that she won't be speaking to them without a lawyer present. So literally the next day, Kristen has lawyered up and is not talking to police at all. So before we get into the actual official investigation, we'd like to thank our last sponsors for today. Whether you're a diehard crime junkie or just looking for a way to make game night more exciting, Hunt a Killer will get your adrenaline pumping as you examine clues solve puzzles, all leading you towards a murderer. Hunt a Killer reinvents the way we interact with murder mysteries. Go from being a viewer safe in the comfort of your own home to an investigator actively involved in solving the case. You can join the community of serial killer enthusiasts and detective minds to see if you have what it takes to hunt a killer. The Murder Mystery subscription box with over 2,000 five-star reviews on Trustpilot will forever change the way you do game night. Satisfy the murder itch with clues delivered right to your door. This immersive experience will give you all the tools necessary to test your detective skills. Each month, a package is delivered to your home containing all the clues and mystery of an escape room and your favorite whodunit show combined. Plus, part of the proceeds for every box goes to the Cold Case Foundation to help fund cold case investigations, which is really cool and something I really Really like about Hunt a Killer. Right now, just for our listeners, you can go to huntakiller.com slash mile higher and use promo code mile higher at checkout for 20% off your first box. Head to huntakiller.com slash mile 
for 20% off and to show support for our podcast, huntakiller.com slash mile higher. So we're all overbooked, overstimulated, and constantly running on empty. For me, I'm always rushing to finish podcast episodes or a video, taking care of all of my pets, and I barely have enough time to eat complete meals. But that's why I love Daily Harvest. It makes it super easy for me to grab something out of the freezer, throw it in the blender, and it's ready to go. Daily Harvest makes it easy to eat more fruits and vegetables with thoughtfully sourced chef-crafted foods that can be prepared in five minutes or less. They work directly with farms to harvest organic fruits and vegetables at their peak and then freeze them within 24 hours to lock in their nutrients, and everything stays fresh until you're ready to enjoy it. You can choose from more than 65 different options like smoothies, hearty soups, harvest bowls, or overnight oats. Each recipe takes one step and is easy to prepare. My personal favorite is the mint and cacao, and it tastes like mint chocolate chip ice cream. It's so good. I just add a little bit of milk to that, and it's good to go. So check it out today at dailyharvest.com and enter in promo code MILEHIGHER to get $25 off your first box. That's promo code MILEHIGHER for $25 off your first box at dailyharvest.com. So even though the police, when they got to the scene, Based upon the evidence and the way that it looked, you know, Jalea's car was actually in the passing lane, I believe, kind of going towards the median. It looked like it it, where it come to a rest. But interesting enough, it was still on. It was still uh, the doors were locked and it was just sitting there where, you know, it eventually had come to a stop Mm -hmm. after she was ejected from it or whatever. So based upon that, it does look like an accident. But the Wood County Sheriff's Office actually conducted a 16-month investigation in which they, you know, you have to do accident reconstruction. You got to do all these different things. You got to look at all these different theories. And based upon that, they have to, you know, figure out what the actual cause of death was, the autopsy, the toxicology, all these different things have to happen. So the Sheriff's Office did do a quite a bit of investigating in this 16 months for this type of accident investigation is actually quite a bit of time. Yeah, it is. And at least they did an investigation versus not even doing one or entertaining that idea at all. Yeah, absolutely. And many would argue they did a very thorough investigation as, as I'll show you here in a second, but the actual official release from the uh, sheriff's office was that she died of multiple catastrophic injuries sustained as an unrestrained driver of a car that lost control struck a guardrail on interstate 77 at approximately the 181 mile post. So that's, that's the other thing with this is that she was not wearing a seatbelt. I'm going to kind of explain how they think this happened. Okay. And sort of what the other side's argument is. So we talked about how Jalea's headlight was on in the car, you know, the overhead light in the compartment or whatever. <laughs> Sorry, stupid. Um, so we talked about the how cabin light kind yeah, of the like, cabin, yeah. that's what it is. So we talked about how the overhead light in the ca- car cabin was on. Um, a lot of people think that maybe Julia was looking for something in the car and possibly driving. And obviously she was very intoxicated. If she was driving, maybe she reached down to look for something or was looking around, got distracted and had an accident. Now, what they basically argue happened was she struck the guardrail a guardrail on the right side, the passenger side on the passenger side and basically drove against that grinding against it. And when she first had made that initial hit that she was thrown forward because she wasn't wearing a seatbelt, she hits the windshield and there's a crack on the windshield Um, on the passenger side, on the passenger Mm -hmm. side. So, but maybe if you're being hit from that side, you know, if the impact's coming from the right, obviously you're going to be thrown in the direction that the impact is coming from. So there's this mark on the top of the windshield. And then they think that after that, that she was thrown against the side of the car, her body, and it broke the window on the passenger side. And at that point, she was thrown halfway out of the vehicle where she was kind of draped over the guardrail. And there's these big I beams, metal steel I beams that Mm -hmm. are reinforcing the actual guardrail itself. Mm -hmm. Super strong. So they think that the car was still moving with no one driving it. Meanwhile, she's halfway out the passenger window and her body is being slammed against these I-beams. And this is what decapitates her. This is what possibly rips off her breast. And that after this, she is thrown up out of the car into the air and lands on the back of the car because there's, well, 
we don't know for sure because there was no proof that there was a dent. I don't think there is a dent in the back of the car, but that's basically what they there's argue. A lot that of she blood. flipped. O- there's a lot of blood, but there's no dent. And then she flipped well, out and landed behind it. Yeah. And in more detail, they think she went onto the top of the car first mm-hmm. and right. she kind of like was moving around there because the car is moving and she's sliding around. Sp- they said spinning around on there. That's wild. And I can't even wrap my head around that. Spinning around on the top of the car and then sort of like slid down onto the back of it where then she then fell into the road and and then someone hit her and then that's when shortly after the semi truck saw something and i think merged over to try to avoid it but then one of the back wheels on the trailer ran over her which then obviously put everything into a bunch of pieces all over the the interstate it sounds kind of crazy but when you have it explained by someone that understands how car accidents work it kind of makes a lot of sense and Emily Nestor had Paul Holes, who's an an expert. He worked on the Golden State Killer case. He's had a ton of experience working on cases. Yeah, he's a crime crime scene technician. And um, he explained how this car accident could have happened and how it's pretty common for this to happen and basically explained how someone's body could be yanked out. And also her shoes were off. He thinks he was yanked right out of her shoes and just the force. Like we can't always understand what it does to a body as just an average person. It's like so insane that your clothes can be ripped off of your body. And it's, it's common for people in accidents to have their clothes ripped off. But wouldn't that look a little different? Wouldn't that be like ripped off and just thrown in random places or different parts of the guardrail? Mm -hmm. I don't understand how it possibly could be like folded up pretty much stacked up bra shirt jacket that Mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense for me no matter how much anyone has tried to explain it yeah i mean that the biggest mystery here is definitely why her clothes are hung up neatly on the guardrail and Mm -hmm. and kim has even said in interviews that the truck driver actually said and i don't i don't have proof of that but the truck driver said that the actual jacket that she was wearing the white jacket was folded on top of the post there on top of it and it was actually the truck driver i believe that took the jacket down and unfolded it and then hung it back up but that's the thing is we don't know for sure if that's what happened or how it was found and also if you think about the people responding there you know obviously they they said that they didn't touch the clothes or they didn't hang up the clothes but i don't know there's a lot of mystery around that So I guess the other argument would be that before she had this accident or before maybe someone hit her, she took her clothes off and folded them up and put them on the side of the road or just her top clothes. I don't know. It doesn't make a lot of sense. It's the weirdest thing. But this is definitely the most confusing part of the whole case mm -hmm. is this stack of clothes. People do get pulled out of their clothes. And if you're hanging out the outside of the window, there is a possibility you're pulled off, but why right. would it be pulled off in that order? You yes. would think it would be the reverse order, right? Yeah. Why would her bra be at the bottom right. of the stack mm-hmm. when if you're be, you'd be jacket, shirt, then mm-hmm. bra, but in fact it was the reverse of that, yeah. which is so bizarre. It's so confusing. But police were actually able to pull DNA samples off the exterior of the vehicle and they determined later that they did belong to Julia. And upon examination, the vehicles found that the driver's side airbag of Julia's car was deployed. And because the passenger airbag did not deploy, investigators were led to believe that Julia was alone at the time of the accident, Mm -hmm. leading them to believe that the cause would have been drunk driving based upon her blood alcohol level, as well as the circumstances of the accident. Right. So that's a whole nother theory is, you know, maybe Kristen was driving the car but obviously police don't think that but it's possible for the passenger seat to not go off especially if she was lifted out of the seat really fast yeah. well and according to kim so they, they did a lot of investigation into the car they actually brought in a kia engineer to look at julia's mm-hmm. kia optima and all cars have sort of like a black box like a plane does a data recorder within the vehicle mm-hmm. that records a bunch of different data about how fast it was going whether airbags deployed right. so after accidents they can go and pull this information up and try to reconstruct the accident is what they use it for and based upon what they found with the recorder was that the passenger airbag should have went off but it actually malfunctioned and that's the reason why it didn't go off is because it just malfunctioned so it's also possible that maybe Jalea wasn't the driver and she was the passenger Mm. and just the airbag didn't go off which would make sense for why if she was sitting in the passenger seat why there'd be a 
crack clearly from a head in the actual right. windshield itself because the other way that they look at it and the way the authorities look at it is she's driving and that the driver's side airbag went off because it was working and that's where she was. And then she flew across the car and maybe hit, you know, didn't go right out the window first, but hit the, the right. windshield. And then as the car's kind of, you know, when you hit a guardrail, you're going to kind of bounce go alongside of it to the left, right? Or exactly. To the right. And then the second time at which it slammed over, Mm because we're talking 70 miles an hour. I mean, this is an interstate, so you're going really fast. So with the Kia thing, you know, they are saying that it malfunctioned. Does that mean that it should have gone off for sure? Does that that, that show us? No. No. All it says is it wasn't working. Okay. So we don't know that it tried to go off and malfunctioned for sure. Okay. So we don't have any proof that someone was in the passenger seat at all that's and that's the thing and the other proof is that the clothes there was like a neat pile of things or clothes Mm -hmm. in the passenger seat so police are like why would there why would there be this neat pile of stuff there if somebody was in that seat and kim julia's mom doesn't believe that that is even true at all because she thinks that they were put there after right so let's kind of explain So there's obviously multiple theories here. There's the theory that she was driving, the theory that she was the passenger. And then there's also a theory um, that the family believes that she was out of the car and was struck with the vehicle as a weapon, that someone used it on her to harm her. Exactly. So that's a whole different. (laughs) Well, because the whole thing, too, is in the family's mind, the injury sustained by her and the damage to the car doesn't make sense. To them, the damage. So when you look at pictures of the car, the car clearly has damage running along the side, passenger mm-hmm. side of it, as well as the front passenger side headlight is completely busted out. So you, you can tell you can it. Tell the impact hit, was on that right. Hit there, right. absolutely. Mm-hmm. And then you can see the windshield crack there. But she believes that the car should have sustained more damage based upon the accident and how fast they were going, and there should have been way more damage to the car than there was. So, and that's why she also believes that the car was used as a weapon based upon the amount of damage to it. Mm -hmm. And that not only was Julia ran over by the car head on, but also dragged along the guardrail is what she believes. Is what created some of the injuries. Right. And because she does believe that the I-beam was the thing that actually... Mm -hmm. You know, she just believes that she was kind of wedged between the guardrail and the car and was dragged along that. Right. And that the evidence shows that and it's not necessarily a drunk, just Julia driving and mm-hmm. being ejected from the vehicle. So the Ohio Medical Examiner's Office actually ruled her death as an accident and it named alcohol as a contributing factor. They were able to determine that Julia's blood alcohol level was 0.19 with testing That's showing high. that she was at 0.24 earlier wow. that night. So, so she drank a ton of, yeah, equivalent to like a sloppy drunk where you're just completely. Yeah. But you would think if you were drinking that much, it would be higher than that. 28 shots. No, I'm yeah, definitely not 28 shots. (laughs) I still know people in college who were taken into detox and tested at like a point three. Yeah. And they were somehow. Well, because they were probably unconscious when they were brought in. She was still conscious. So right. it kind of makes sense for how much she was at. There's no way she had it 28 shots. It just blows my though. mind I, I that agree. she was that supposedly that belligerent ahead of time. I mean, I guess makes it doesn't no really sense. matter in the end, but it's just a, it's weird how it's all playing out. Mm-hmm. She clearly was very intoxicated, though. Obviously, shouldn't have been driving. Like, what is that? Triple the intoxication level for legal driving? Yeah, I don't know what the exact uh, limit is in uh, Ohio, but that's pretty high. Yeah, I think it's at least double uh, mm-hmm. the legal limit. But I wanted to uh, also read some extra details surrounding the accident itself that the police essentially told uh, Julia's mom. And this is and this gives you a better idea of what they think actually happened. So they said, so essentially what killed Julia was striking the guardrail post. When she struck the guardrail post, it's believed that she kind of started flipping end over end and landed on top of the car. And now at this point, the car is leaving the berm and coming back out to the interstate with two passenger side tires going flat. So you can see on the vehicle, the passenger tires are completely flat and because of the guardrail. Julia is actually riding on top of the car, whether she was rolling, flipping, spinning. She's doing that and she's losing a lot of blood as she is doing this. What the hell? That is so hard to understand. Like this must have been in a matter of seconds. Yeah. And she's up there flipping. Well, 
get flipped over the top of it. Yeah. And spinning. I mean, it's not quite as dramatic as I think that these the word choice they used is. Mm. But if you think about it, at a high rate of speed, if something hits and goes airborne, it's going to start flying through. Yeah, the but air. wouldn't it fly off the car? Why would it stay up there and just stay there? Yeah. I mean, the big thing for me is it's hard to, you know, see yeah. her flipping and how does she go out the passenger side window running against the guardrail uh-huh. to then Flip all of a sudden going roof. backwards, landing on the roof. And then sliding down to me, it almost seems like she would have went over the guardrail and into the the other on the other side into right. the grass. That's what you'd think. Because they found a hat. They found a hat like 14 feet on the other side of the. And it was her hat that she was wearing that had blood smeared all over. Oh my it gosh! On the other side of the guardrail that was never addressed either. So it, it's it doesn't make. I mean, it could work. But also, I think there's enough doubt that you have to think, well, why didn't she just go over the guardrail then? Mm-hmm. And that's where she ended up. And it's not really hard to understand, especially when you're not an expert in these car accidents and like reconstruction of car accidents. Obviously, there's really hard to understand how this works, the physics of it. Yeah, it does. And again, there is blood all over the rear of the vehicle, too. So this this theory kind of does make mm-hmm. sense. So she rolls off of the top of the car onto the trunk of the car. And as she's rolling off of the car, the car is now out into driving lanes, which is the right lane on I-77. And the car continues up the road because, again, the momentum of the car is going to keep it going for a while. The fact that you're going on a downhill slope is going to keep the momentum going for a while. But the two front passenger side tires going flat is going to slow the car down and the pitch of the road is going to take her to the inside. But when you get into the right bend, the pitch of the road is going to take you to the right. So that's was I was, you know, when I had to go hmm, and try to put pieces together, I didn't want to destroy any evidence. And that's why our detectives get uh, got involved. Not to say that all of us aren't trained to collect evidence, but when you get into specialized area, for instance, crash investigation, I do that. And when you get into the investigation aspects, that's what these guys do. So again, when we started putting all this stuff together, we came to the conclusion that the vehicle swerved to the right and the vehicle front end hit the guardrail and then the rear of the vehicle smacked the guardrail. It ejected Julia out of the passenger side and there could be many reasons. I mean, when she hit the guardrail, she could have been going and she could have come forward and she could have been leaning for something. The airbag in her size could have helped project here. I mean, there's so many different things that we're never going to know the full answer, but nonetheless ejected her out the passenger side window and she had struck one and then a second guardrail post on the outside of the guardrail. So that was from the responding deputy that uh, deputy D I believe that was his statement about uh, what he observed at the scene and what he thought happened uh, with the accident. But now let's look at the other side here, because according to Kim Davis, she believes that there's evidence that supports the other theory that this was in fact murder and an intentional uh, murder. So like we said, Kim believes she was hit by her own car. And she fatally hit her head on a guardrail post and then her body was dragged by her car 82 feet into the passing lane where her remains were later found. So Kim has said that the location of her daughter's body and her car make it impossible to believe it was an accident. In my mind, it was not an accident. I don't see how they will be able to explain it that way. Somebody did something. Why didn't she spend the night? Why was she crying and upset? Why did she want to meet her sister? All these things don't make sense. I don't see how they can say it was an accident. These things just don't add up. My kids are all I have and I'm not going to give up on this. And that was a post from her Justice for Julia Facebook page. Well, it's definitely confusing to think about why why would she have called for a ride if she was willing to just, you know, drive anyway? Unless it was possible that while Kristen was holding her keys from her and refusing to let her drive, that she was calling her sister and stuff and being like, they won't let me drive. You need to come pick me up. And then eventually they got mad with her, annoyed with her, and was like, you know what, screw you, whatever, and threw the keys to her. That breaks the keychain. And then she, you know, is like, okay, well, I'll just drive, or I'll drive to meet my sister at the place. To a place, a meeting place, yeah. Yeah. Or, I mean, when you're drunk, you, like, aren't thinking things through, and um, it's just such a shame that they left her, and they didn't even see whether or not she got in the car, and... It's like, why would you... It's so stupid. Why wouldn't you just stay with her? until her uh, it's so dumb i mean none of them were thinking but they were all just trashed yeah which w- could explain why she's upset i mean a lot of people get upset when they when they oh, get yeah. drunk and have fights and mm-hmm. so and people get pissed when you take their car keys i've had friends that drive drunk 
and I've taken their car keys, they get mad. We've had an experience with that for sure. Mm -hmm. So here's another post from Kim uh, that she posted on her justice for Julia Facebook page about the clothes. Actually, that's kind of interesting. So pictures of my daughter's white coat hanging on the guardrail, look closely under the coat and you will see a black top also hanging under her top was her bra. Notice that the sleeves of the coat are not turned inside out and how the clothing is in reverse order of how it'd be laying if it was torn from her body as the sheriff's department claims. Now that's confusing too. Like how was it inside out or it wasn't inside out. It should have been. Yeah. If you're getting pulled out, everything's going to come off inside right. out. That makes no sense, especially with how fast it happens. And mm. what's interesting too, is when you actually look at the bra itself, uh, based upon how it actually ripped off was like from the weakest point of the bra from the back. Oh, so it's, which I mean, you know, depending on how it really just depends on how her body was when she was hanging out the window, uh -huh. um, when she's being dragged along the guardrail or pinned between the car and the guardrail. It just really depends. But still, it just seems very hard to believe that all three got ripped off in that order and ended up on the, the post like that. It's extremely hard to believe. I just don't believe it. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there was anyone that was at the scene that just didn't report doing this, but like yeah. moved them or maybe that truck driver was confused about what he did. I mean, he did just see something really traumatic. He sounded really upset on the phone. Maybe he didn't really know what he was doing. He was just like grabbing at things and, or could have stacked them up. I mean, I don't know. Well, for all we know, like there was a couple other 911 calls prior to yeah. the truck driver getting there. Mm -hmm. So potentially somebody got out of their car and when they called Maybe that person respect? that seemed really like upset and like, I think it's somebody in the, yeah. yeah, out of respect. Just, but, but like, who does that? It does, doesn't make a lot of sense. Like clearly, you know that you need to leave everything the way it is so that they can yeah, investigate but you're not it. thinking when you're right. in like this, you know, maybe they thought they were trying to help or I don't know. I don't know. It just, there's no way they ended up like that on their own. I just don't believe it. Mm -hmm. But it's like, like I said earlier, you know, if you're, if you believe that she was murdered, what would be the point of making her take her clothes off at the beginning? Or did she take them off and then was murdered? I mean, well, it then, still doesn't then, make sense. Like, for example, let's look at the right breast being severed. Right. How does that happen? I mean, I think the guardrail for sure mm -hmm. ripped it off. Yeah. God. It, I, I don't see how that could happen from being hit with a car, maybe being hit, uh, you know, afterwards when she was laying there, but initial impact if she was standing, that wouldn't make any sense. And another point to make is, you know, her, her leg was broke at her hip bone, like the upper part of her leg and this car, the hood is really low. It, yeah. very low to the ground and if she was hit standing up she would have had both of her lower parts of her leg broken right or at least one yeah the break wouldn't be up high yeah so there's that and they did i mean they did find there was actual brain matter on the post so we know that that she for sure hit the post yes, that's definitely how she died i think everyone agrees that her death was from the guardrails mm -hmm. and a lot of kim's reasoning for why this was murder is the fact that just the damage mm -hmm. she, she doesn't believe that if you know so, uh, an accident of this caliber were to happen there would be far more damage to both the car and the guardrail itself she believes that if it wasn't just somebody intentionally running somebody against the guardrail and it was in fact slamming into it you would think that the guardrail would have been more damaged because if you look at pictures of the guardrail in the post there's virtually no damage to it at all but isn't it made out of but that's the thing is when you, know. you do look into it and look at other examples guardrails are built to withstand major major impact i mean they're built to withstand a semi right or a huge heavy bus hitting it with lots of speed and withstanding the impact i mean yeah. that, that otherwise they wouldn't serve their purpose you know if you yeah. went into a guardrail it just fell over or it became really damaged and they'd be repairing guardrails all the time. So obviously with all of this, the family has wanted more answers to the questions that they have and the questions that frankly all of us have mm -hmm. about what happened. And one of the things that she has done is started looking into the friends that Julia was with that night. And what she found was that Kristen, Katie and Freddie were all children of current or former members of the Parksburg police department. So the police department in the area, or even having relatives that were a former sheriff. So she's starting to look at that angle because Kim is very adamant that the police are, have some involvement in this and may even be covering up 
aspects of this case in order to fit their narrative. And, and that, that's mainly because everyone that was involved in this is somehow connected, connected to, to law enforcement officer. in some yeah. way, which I mean, it, it does happen. And, and these, this is a smaller community, so it's not all that crazy as, as you and I have found for people to be mm -hmm. friends, relatives, brothers of uh, somebody in law enforcement. So right. is there something there? I don't know, but it is definitely something to know, I think. Yeah, they think that they're being protected. And I think one thing that just started everything off on the wrong note was Kristen getting that lawyer, whether or not that was for a good reason. I'm, I mean, it just didn't look good to the family for her to get a lawyer immediately before even talking to police, which and I'm, I'm thinking the parents mind, they were like, OK, you gave someone their keys back when they were drunk. You could be held responsible for this. We need to get a lawyer. So I guess it kind of makes sense, but it just started everything off on the wrong note. Right. Well, I think it's hard when she sees other friends that were with Julia come forward and talk mm -hmm. and all and Kristen who mm -hmm. was, as it's far sketchy. as we know, one of the last people to be seen with her mm -hmm. is lawyering up and she's not saying anything. That's why I think there's more to the story. Mm -hmm. And I think they are responsible in some way or Kristen is responsible in some way. And she knows it because why else would you, you know, if you're totally innocent, then why don't you stand behind that innocence and fight for your innocence? And and even if people, you know, you come out and you say this is what happened and people don't believe you, at least it's out there like that. I think the whole staying quiet and just having a lawyer to yeah. represent you and not saying anything about it is definitely especially when one suspicious. of your friends died and mm -hmm. it's just yeah like, exactly it's like uh, well how good of a friend were you and mm -hmm. would you be capable of doing something to Julia and and that's essentially what Kim believes and the Davis family believes is that Kristen is withholding information about what happened that night and she knows way more than she has not said so mm -hmm. so like i had mentioned earlier the case was officially closed mm -hmm. by law enforcement and ruled an accident but because of all of these sketchy mm -hmm. things surrounding that night mm -hmm. and Kristen specifically kim and the davis family are fighting to reopen the case because they believe they have enough evidence to prove that this was a murder and that something much more sinister happened to Julia that night and it wasn't just an accident. So obviously Kim Davis is very disappointed with law enforcement and their lack of wanting to help them investigate this further and reopen the case and look at the evidence that she's collected. And so she's posted a bunch of different transcripts and interviews mm -hmm. with her friends on their Facebook page. And also she's brought up, I think a very valid point that there's definitely some inconsistencies in the different accounts of what happened that night. And with the friend saying that she was really intoxicated, but then at other times saying she wasn't drunk. And obviously the timestamps of everything and at what point did Julia actually get in the car and drive or somebody else, maybe they went after her in a, another car. I mean, we don't know, but there's mm -hmm. definitely some inconsistencies there. When police investigated this case, they have to try to figure out the timeline and, and put where all the people involved were at the time of the accident. And they have to try to figure out what they were doing or if they could have been at the scene of the accident or been involved with it. And the only way they're able to sort of figure out an alibi for Freddie, Kristen and Katie was there was a McDonald's camera that captured Freddie's car going mm -hmm. through the drive through in which you can make out Freddie in the driver's seat. But we're not able to make out who else is in the car with him. But police essentially took that and used it as their alibi saying that Katie, Kristen and Freddie were all in the vehicle. Which you can't at McDonald's. tell who the females are, but you can see that there are two female passengers. You know, it's just like you can't see their heads. Right. And the timestamp on this McDonald's shot is at 333. When police were questioning Kristen, she was asked if she had heard the conversation between Tabby and Julia, to which she answered yes. And then Kristen quoted Julia's last words to Tabby, and that conversation was at 3.38, yet Freddie's car exited the McDonald's parking lot at 3.33, which would mean that either Julia was in the Freddie's car with Kristen or Kristen was in Julia's car with Julia at that point in time. Well, I feel like there's no possible way Julia was with them because it's six miles away, the McDonald's from the crash site. Mm -hmm. And that would leave absolutely no time. They would have had to been driving super fast. You'd have to get out immediately, have the accident, and someone calls by Well, if she was with them, 
the murder would have had to happen uh, in a matter under 10 minutes. Right. Because the first 911 call of somebody driving past seeing the scene was mm -hmm. at 341. Oh, 41. Okay. So that 333 to 341, if Julie is with those two. That's crazy. And they're going to murder her. And they just got McDonald's. Why would they like get McDonald's with her and then murder her? That's that's a big question. Yeah. It's hard to see that happening. But, you know, the other the flip side is that maybe it was not. Kristen in the car because we don't know who exactly is in the car with Freddie. Right. That's the big question is right. Freddie has not said who is in the car with him. Mm -hmm. So we don't know if it was Kristen or Katie that was in the car. Well, there was two females. Yeah. And there was someone in the back seat, I guess, and you couldn't even see. Who Maybe that it was someone random that's not Kristen. Right. So that's. Mm. Well, and they were hanging out with the other person, Jordan, as well. So it could have been. Right. It may not have been a female. I mean, we don't know. It's when you look at the, sh the screenshot that the police had to look at, it's not a lot of detail there. I mean, mm -hmm. you can barely even see Freddie in the, mm -hmm. the driver's seat. So. so you definitely can't prove that Kristen was there and not with Jalea instead. Right. But I think it's pretty difficult to say Jalea was at the McDonald's. That's no, it doesn't mm -hmm. really make any sense. But I think one of the major reasons for why mm -hmm. the Davis family believes that there's more to the story and that this was a uh, potentially murder is because of what these friends have been saying after the fact. Yeah, just their actions. And their they've, attitudes and mm -hmm. their whole demeanor. Just seem mean. Mm -hmm. like they just seem like they don't give a shit and they're angry and they're fighting all the time. Like Freddie, Freddie Scott's Twitter is just like awful. Mm -hmm. he, he compared it. He said, my pet cat got murdered in my hometown and my fish is still swimming around the tank free. Please help. Like mocking. Yeah. Um, he's saying justice for Jalea is all lies and rumors. Nobody killed that girl. If you had half a brain, you would know that. I just don't understand why you have to go to that extent and say all this. It's like, just leave the family alone. It reminds me of the Christian and Drakio case. Totally. You know, people just bullying them online and all this negativity surrounding it, mm -hmm. which I understand because I do see that they feel like someone's being wrongly accused of murder, which is a big deal. And that's why it's so, this case is so difficult. And I don't want to jump to conclusions and say that I think someone was murdered or not because I, I obviously don't know. And that's a big accusation at someone to say that they murdered someone with a car. Yeah. And I mean, I can see how that could upset you for sure, especially if you, if were, you were the person being accused, mm -hmm. but it's like you can take a different approach. And I feel like their approach has been absolutely terrible and it's driven a lot of people to get involved in this, to be angry and just their behavior is so off-putting that it makes you feel like you must have done something. And I think in a way that they did, I think they're, they're, they know something, whether Kristen and Freddie or just Kristen, like something is missing. They are keeping something for sure because it just doesn't add up. No, it doesn't. It really doesn't. I mean, to me, when somebody is even remotely involved in especially a fatal car accident or incident that if you were even remotely friendly with them as a decent human being, you would try to provide as much help and detail surrounding yeah. what happened that night and just offer some like compassion to the family. Yeah, exactly. You, know? you had just, you were one of the people to yeah. be with her in her final moments. Your like, friend was murdered. This is died. apparently your friend. Unless something really bad happened that night and it wasn't just a fight over, you know, getting her car keys back. Maybe something really bad happened that night and Kristen did something really mean or they got in a huge fight and they were like, we're never going to be friends again. I mean, is it possible that even in her death, they just like were still mad at her about something that happened earlier that night or a fight they were in? I mean, their attitude here is just so poor. It definitely makes you think something is missing that we don't know about. Yeah. Well, I mean, as far as we know, I don't think they were as good as friends as we'd like to think, you know, like mm -hmm. I think Freddie met her the first time that night. Like, Oh, this was he? yeah this was that's what he says is that he had just met her and i think she julia knew Kristen, so it was kind of like yeah. mutual friends of Kristen that she was with that night so mm -hmm. it wasn't even people she was really all that familiar with plus i mean we don't know what these people are capable of either so there's that another reason why kim thinks that they did something is because there were fingerprints on the outside of the car that police never tested but we can't you know confirm whose they were or if it had anything to do with the car accident Another thing she argues is that when she hit her head on the windshield, there should be blood or hair in that spot, and there wasn't. So I don't know. It's just an extremely difficult. And case. not only that, she also said that 
the car should have been found with the doors unlocked. And the fact that the doors were locked was weird. But then again, I'm like, well, if she, if she was that, driving, she could have locked herself in. Right. She was alone by herself at night. Right. Drinking. And if you go out I the window, then the doors are going to stay locked because the car's still on. Right. The car doesn't know that right. you went out the window. But she's saying that according to the Kia engineer, that if the airbag deploys, the lock should automatically come off. Well, I just think it's really weird that she says that because why would they want the car door to unlock? Because then wouldn't your chances of being ejected from the car get even higher if you know, the doors could theoretically open a lot easier. Wouldn't you want the car to lock you in and the airbags to go off, you know, so hopefully you're going to stay in the car? I mean, yeah, I, well, maybe they have it so that they unlock because when first responders get there, they don't want the doors to be locked. Yeah. Maybe they automatically unlock, but I don't know. That's what the key about cars. That's That's why it's so hard to form an opinion on this. I mean, that came from the Kia engineer Mm -hmm. that that was what should have happened. And the fact that the, car was still on and and locked and in the condition that it was makes it suspicious that potentially somebody who could have been in the car or again like kim believes there could have been even another car with people involved with Mm -hmm. it could have locked it after it came to rest and so i don't know there's just it's hard because there's not enough to say you know how it how it would have happened yeah it's very difficult but i do think it's worth it to listen to Paul Hole's explanation on the Mile Marker 181 podcast and just having, I guess, someone more expert than us explain to you that theory before you make up your mind. Which is the last episode of the podcast that has been released. So Yeah, she said she was going to release five episodes kind of debunking her own work from the past couple months, but then she stopped. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if she's going to continue because, I mean, people have been really upset. And I see why. But I also do understand, like, if you... It's really, really tough. I mean, if you're here to help someone, it's kind of hard to change your opinion on them. But at the same time, she wants to like be true to herself and maintain journalistic integrity. But I don't know. It's just, it's a really difficult situation. I I don't feel, I just. Yeah, it's really tough. It's really tough to know which way mm-hmm. I lean. And, you know, you look at the evidence and this way seems much more probable. But then again, there's so many different things a close that just yeah. remain huge yeah. questions and i mean the other right. two things i was going to finish off with was that a woman named ember stafford in 2012 claimed to be a witness to this incident and she said she stated and she stated that she saw another car force julia's car off the road and which resulted in the accident happening but this person was actually found to be lying. They, you know, obviously followed up with her and, and investigated it. And she actually ended up going to jail for making a false report about this because police spent a ton of time on this and they found it to be false. That this didn't happen at all. And this mm-hmm. person went to jail. But also in 2013, the internet hacktivist group Anonymous even announced that they would be taking action to expose a police cover up in relation to Julia's case. But nothing ever came of that as far as we know i mean maybe they tried to to hack the wood county sheriff's office or something but i think all these different things have also kind of fueled the the fire for the murder theory mm-hmm. and that there is so many people that do question what happened and that they do need to reopen the case and take another look at it or have another authority come in like the fbi or you know the actual mm-hmm. Uh, Bureau of investigation for Ohio or and take a look at it and see if maybe some things were missed or covered up. And I mean, based upon reading the police statements for deputy Deem and stuff, I'm, I'm not that impressed with his ability to accurately recount what happened. And and in a way that makes sense, I feel like that's one of the most important skills a police officer should should have is being able to communicate what you see, what you witness and write it down so that it can be recorded and looked at later on or during police statements uh, that they give, you can just tell that may not be the the brightest of the bunch that was working on this case. I don't think they even really presented that theory to, you know, the Davis family in a way that made sense to them. Like right. they were just like, she was the one driving, she got in an accident. And, you know, an average person looking at this is like, what the hell, this is the craziest accident. How could this have happened? But maybe if they explained it more thoroughly the way that, you know, Paul Holes explains it in that podcast, maybe they could have understood that theory a little more. 
Like you should know how to work with people, how to explain things, how to be sensitive when explaining things. And they just don't feel like they've been treated with that compassion. And I think that's what's really lacking here. Yeah. Even the way they talk about the case, like in interviews, they don't have that compassion that I feel they should. Yeah, not as, I mean, that. I think that's just kind of police in general. I think that mm-hmm. they, they do deal with so much right. of this it that hard. they can't be like overly that. sympathetic in mm-hmm. every single case. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, from what we saw from the interview with the, the uh, chief or sheriff, or whatever, he seemed like he understood to some extent why they're upset. Yeah. But then again, it comes down to evidence. You can't mm-hmm. just go indict somebody for murder without evidence right. to support that. It will get thrown out. There's no, you know, you can't get a judge to sign off on that unless there's an adequate amount of evidence. And that's the whole fight is that Kim thinks she has it and has enough to indict all mm-hmm. these people mm-hmm. and send them to jail. But well, the hair alone too. I'm curious about that. Cause if you presented you know, you hair to the police and being like, this is from so-and-so. Yeah, they can't take that into evidence. That would not totally admissible. not be admissible in court. No way. Right. So she's trying to do, I understand why she's mm-hmm. fighting. I understand I so why she's her. doing it. It's so much pain. I can't even imagine the the grief that mm-hmm. this has caused and, and how it's changed her And having to go over lives. it again and again in the crime scene in her body. Like as a mother, she had to look at autopsy photos. That's terrible. Yeah. And then it's, it's horrible. I really feel for this family, Mm -hmm. you know, and I don't know. I mean, I support their fight and I think it's good. They should keep going. You know, if they truly believe that this was a murder, that's what you do. You fight for your loved one. And I respect their fight for sure. Absolutely. And I mean, I hope they go and and try to put all of the evidence because if you want to know more and look into the case and all the photos that are out there just tons more detail justice for Julia on Facebook. They yeah. have a group there. You can go and join the group and, mm-hmm. and provide support to the family, but also look at all the evidence she's collected. She's posted a lot of it there. And her hope is that she can try to get an attorney so that she can actually put all this together and present it to a court and try to at least get the investigation reopened or, or something, mm-hmm. uh, somebody to have some sort of accountability for what happened that night. Yes. Well, we want to know your opinions. We want to know, you know, your thoughts, even if you can't fully make up your mind, uh, anything that we may not have thought of as far as theories of what could have happened. We're always open to hearing what you guys have to say. Absolutely. It's again, it's, it could go either way. And I think based upon the physical evidence, it definitely looks more like a car accident. But then when you look at the clothes on the post, you look at all of the different, you know, sketchy things that have happened with the, people that were with her that night as well as their uh what they gave the statements they gave to police and just the timeline itself just is so fuzzy there's mm-hmm. not there's not a clear timeline of, of what order things went in and at what time they happened so there's definitely i mean i think there's a big possibility that Kristen may have even been driving i mean i do too i agree with that it just seems like I think she's in some way responsible and that's why she got a lawyer and she knows it. She knows whether more. It's she gave her the keys or she was the one driving something weird happened. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah. She definitely knows more than what she's saying. I'm sure. Yeah. In our opinion. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we'll leave links to all of, all of the uh, groups and everything where you can look into this further. But yeah. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode of the Mount Hard podcast. If you did, Be sure to subscribe on iTunes and Spotify. And this is one of those cases that might be worth watching on YouTube as well, because we will have uh, some of the photos and things like that. So you can get a better visual representation of what happened and just kind of put the pieces together. Because I feel like this one is so confusing that definitely having some of the visuals helps uh, help you understand it. So, but yeah, we'll leave it there and we will see you guys next time. Stay safe and stay woke.